you could speak for me. Just count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's great. And one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm actually going to record mine because this might be a podcast too, which I think would be kind of cool. Uh, you might have to edit some of this shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we get started, I just wanted to point out that Adam is no longer part of the Wasteland World staff or ownership, and the opinions he expresses in this interview do not necessarily represent those of the Wasteland World team. And now that the disclaimer's out of the way. <laughs> what happened? We did this ourselves. They're coming. It can't be. Where is everyone? Hello, survivors, and welcome to a very special episode of the Apocalypse Post. I'm your host, Makeshift, and for all you Wastelanders out there, you may have heard that Wasteland Weekend co-owner, Build Chief, and Artistic Director, Adam Chilson, announced his retirement on the Wasteland stage right before the attack show during Wasteland Weekend 2022. And for many of us, it was quite the surprise. Adam's been with Wasteland from the very beginning, shooting promo photography in 2010 and becoming co-owner alongside Wasteland Weekend co-founders Jared Butler and Carl Bartoszynski, where he stayed until his official last event, Neotropolis 2023. The look and feel of Wasteland City has almost everything to do with his vision for the event, and his very first build was to recreate a version of the tire walls from the oil refinery in the Road Warrior to create the iconic main gates of Wasteland City in 2011. It separated general camping from the newly created theme zone. Over the years, Adam's been known for having an incredible vision for each year's build and the know-how to do it, but has sometimes had a hard time communicating that vision to his crew of volunteers. His yearly start of build season meeting generally included a drawing in the sand session, and his backyard became Wasteland HQ, or the yard as he calls it, filled with scraps of metal, handmade storage containers, and several apocalypse vehicles. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Adam over the years and interviewing him several times, but none was so open and honest as the one you're about to hear. In the early years, we talked about growing Wasteland and bringing in new hordes of Wastelanders. There was always some new build, storyline, or crazy plan for each event. As the years went by and the event got more complicated with more governmental red tape, more volunteers, more rules, a little bit of that spark left his eyes. Build weeks were always frustrating with no-show volunteers, broken down vehicles, and the morale of the build crew always on edge due to the harsh conditions of the Mojave Desert. It's tough to stay nice when you're hot, tired, and dehydrated. I'm glad Adam decided to sit down with me for one last talk. Leaned up in the shade against the rear tire of his wasteland car, a Mustang he calls Fury, and wearing a pair of sound-canceling headphones that's become a standard non-themed part of his wasteland wear, we sat for hours. At times, conducting a regular interview and at other times just shooting the shit and getting to know what drove him to this decision. And what's next for him, Wasteland, and his car, Fury. I'm going to break this one up into two parts because it's a little shy of two hours. But I wanted you guys to hear as much of what Adam had to say as possible. Because I think there's more than a few lessons to be learned. So let's jump into part one of Passing the Torch with Adam Chilson. All right, let's start off by just having you introduce yourself and your role here at Wasteland Weekend. <laughs> My name is Adam Chilson, art director and chief of operations, among other things, and uh, one of the co-owners of Wasteland Weekend. How long have you been doing it? Uh, Wasteland? Yeah. Uh, since 2010. Very first one. Fantastic. Tell me about how you get started. Uh, in post-apocalyptic, or in Mad, or in Mad Max, or Wasteland, or what? I guess, yeah, Wasteland. But but uh, you know, I guess Wasteland wasn't your first journey into this world. So, no, I've always had you know the the post-apocalypse on the brain. Uh, you know, even before I knew really what Road Warrior and you know a lot of that was, I always imagined I could see the world if people didn't exist. If for one day everything just stopped. I loved going through old abandoned buildings, abandoned places where this is what the world would look like in 20 years and 50 years and 100 years, what was left behind. And, you know, I've written novels, I've written some content for, for games, uh, and it's it always drifts back to the post-apocalypse. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, tell me about how that brought you to Wasteland. 
So I saw, <laughs> I saw the uh, advertisement for it and I really wanted to go do it, but uh, normally that time of year, it's I'm um, gearing up for car shows. I was doing uh, uh, live events. I was doing uh, the uh, circuit for trade shows, like the big LA car show, uh, you know, design, building, the, the exhibits. And that's the busiest time of year. It just so happened that I was walking away from that industry <laughs> and uh, saw the advertisement for Wasteland. And they were looking for somebody to do uh, prom promotional photography. So I sent them a message. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, well, I'm the guy you want because you're not going to find anyone better. <laughs> <laughs> and I meet up with uh, some guy named Jared out in, you know, I tell him, hey, this is a spot we're going to meet. And we do some promo photography for, for the event. And I went all in. Like, this wasn't just, oh, yeah, we could have just stopped and done a few pictures. It looked good, but no, nah, we're really going to take this to the next level. I had the whole truck loaded with propane and flamethrowers and fire gear. We drove way out to some old abandoned buildings. And uh, Jared was like, yeah, cool. Hey, we got our pictures. Like, no, no, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did some sketchy shit. Um, but got some really good pictures, most of which have probably never seen the light of day. But uh, yeah, I was in. Nice. So were you part of staff for 2010? I was not part of staff. Um, I was brought in uh, to do the promotions for the event. And I was actually going to try and be a vendor, do photography at the event. You know, a day in, it turned out nobody actually really gave a fuck. Uh, also, I told Jared and I told, you know, Carl, yeah, I ain't taking pictures at your event. I, I'm done. Once I, once I get there, I'm off the fucking clock. Yeah, that lasted 10 minutes. Uh, you know, the next thing I know, I was out directing the group photo shoot, you know, running around out in the desert with Paul Miller in some of the themed cars and you know, people I still know to this day that they're friends. 2010 was, yeah, I was all in. And so now that transition to you being an owner, was it by 2011? 2011, uh, uh, James Howard, who was you know with the event from the beginning, or at least in 2010 he was, uh, I didn't know him that well. He decided he wasn't going to be a part of it anymore, and they needed somebody to do the uh, do the builds, to do the setup. You know, again, in my usual humble approach, was like, yeah, well, I'm the guy to do this, and good luck finding somebody who can do it better. Uh, I'm going to hold to that. <laughs> Even now? <laughs> Even now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, James Howard steps down, and the first time you and I met was in twenty eleven, the spring of 2011. Jared invited me up for a build day, and, yeah. you, and you guys were building the first Wasteland City Gates. Yep. Tell me about how that project came up and why we were building it in your backyard. Well, there wasn't a Wasteland build crew. That didn't exist. Uh, there wasn't... Any of the, st the structures that there, the Wasteland 2010 was a few hundred people camping in a field. Uh, and that's, uh, it was still magical in its own way, but it wasn't, it wasn't Wasteland as we know it now. It wasn't a place. It didn't feel like you were really entering a post-apocalyptic town or city or settlement. It was just some random people who you happened to meet out in the desert. It was still fun, but I wanted to take it to where you were entering a full post-apocalyptic world. And there was no budget. There was no crew. It was just a handful of us, you know, three, four people at first, going out, <laughs> collecting tires off the side of the road, acquiring things through creative means, just scavenging what we could. We'd see something in someone's backyard, knock on the front door, and most of the time ask permission if they wanted. It was junk, but yeah, we were little hooligans and just dragged that shit back to my yard and started building. And I had this idea for building gates that were inspired by the road warrior now oh we didn't know the fuck we were doing we were just stacking tires and then when that didn't work we tried bolting them together and that was arguably not much better uh, the gate structure was stuff i traded i traded i bartered uh i did photography work for places to get for free just to get you know access to some stuff that i needed to build and to try and fund that project i was doing photography 
at the gates. I was doing photography for, you know, content for websites. I even rented out parts of my property with different sets that I was building in order to pay for the stuff I was building. You know, no budget. And more and more people kept coming on board, more people that, uh, you know, Spud joined us and was, you know, integral because we didn't know that, again, I had some experience with welding, but I wasn't the guy who really should have been welding. We had some talent that joined us and became a part of it. And we, those first gates is, those were iconic. And where you joined is when we had just, when I say finished, no, we were still welding shit. Oh yeah, we were, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, that I, day you guys were like yeah, we were cutting holes shit. and patching holes and. Yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't until yeah, the lights went down. Uh, shitty welder that, uh, stick welder that was stuck on one setting too high and a, and a mask that just went black when you sparked up so you were welding by braille. <laughs> I gotta kid you not, this is what we build it with. We had a single uh, card table, plastic card table, and a chop saw from Harbor Freight. I'm really proud of what we accomplished. Tell me what it was like to set up that wall in 2011 at H Park for the first time. Oh, it was that was sketchy as fuck. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have these tire t tire towers that are bolted together with this piece of steel strapped to the back so they don't tip over, which we found out later was a terrible idea too. <laughs> uh, and every time we'd have we'd be in there trying to bolt the tires together, somebody drop a wrench or screw, we had to send somebody small down the tire tower to go find whatever thing we'd lost somewhere down the tire it was in a tire in the ground uh you know the the gates themselves we'd never really you know moved it and set it up and that was part of the thing you couldn't just build it you had to build it to take it apart to move it set it up again bring it back and my experience with the uh, with trade shows helped with that but most of that was designed to go on concrete floors uh you know set up with heavy equipment we had to do all of this by hand in the wind in the desert uh, it was a good challenge. I still kind of enjoy that. Yeah, and the result was stunning. I, I mean, it was it was it made wasteland because that was also the year that the city was split from from the general camping. We made wasteland city the place where the very first tribes and groups and camps that had themed their camps could come and live in a fully immersive environment. It was magic walking through those gates the first time into that city. It really was. And that was also the first, well, I mean, it wasn't the first tribe, but it was the first year of tribes yes. and themed camps and yep. that kind of thing. Talk to me about a few of the tribes that stood out that year. Well, I'll tell you about a few of them that are still here. Uh, looking at some of the pictures, because some of we, there wasn't really tribe applications. There were just some random stuff that people had submitted. <laughs> I remember... Carl saying, okay, hey, there's, there's this group that just spray painted some shit on a tent and they want to do, I don't know what this thing is with bottle caps. They, they are they, they're gambling. I don't, this looks like crap. I don't know what this is. I'm like, dude, new, new Vegas, man. It's fucking new Vegas. Right. Yeah. He wasn't super into it, but it was like, all right, cool. We'll give it a shot. Some of the other tribes that uh, wanted to do more of an MFP theme, but they have consistently every year never made it. They fall apart before they get there, so that's and that still is happening. There was some tribe that Carl didn't want to have there at all because those shitbox little cars he didn't think were post-apocalyptic. And then I remember, remember seeing this little convoy of the Scions roll in. They were they were fucking cyber. They were they weren't they weren't they were urban. They're like urban apocalypse. Like we imagined the, you know, the desert, but um, that was absolutely apocalyptic urban feel. And some guy drives up and he's all, hey, man, beep, 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 Joyce. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, you here for the camp? Yeah, Joyce, man. We, I'm, you, I'm like, are you, a, I, I don't remember. Are you a fully themed camp? Like, oh, yeah, beep, 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 Joyce. <laughs> Still wasn't sure what he told me, but like, all right, here you are right in front of the gates. You're the first ones up. <laughs> <laughs> that was road rash <laughs> that was road rash <laughs> <laughs> dukes of the nuke fucking wcc first year uh, a little toyota truck rolls up with this sh crappy antenna sticking out the back and i'd already filled almost all the spaces but i still had a hole in the wall because we were trying to make the wall and i was like hey man you want to be a part of the wall he's all hey sure hey, what's your name the swede all right man and there's I still remember that tennis sticking out one way and he's sleeping in the back of the truck next to his sound gear. 
And now he's still part of the wall. That's true. It's the, uh, the WCC is one of the main structures of Wasteland City. Mm-hmm. And they've grown so much. Yep. If not one of the bigger tribes, they've got one of the biggest builds, the most involved. And their camp is themed inside and outside. Like yeah. You, you cannot go deep enough and find a Coleman cooler or... Every aspect, once you walk into that camp, you are still immersed. Yeah, it's incredible. All right, so 2011 also started your vision of Wasteland City becoming how we built Wasteland City. Can you tell me a little bit about how your vision was, what your vision was back then and how's, how it, how's it changed over the years? Wasteland, to me, for Wasteland City and has always been, it's the great gathering of tribes. It's the survivors of the apocalypse and what that would look like and the imagining of if everybody came together in one place to celebrate another year of being alive. And it has evolved some over the years, but the vision of it is still the same. When you stand on the streets anywhere within Wasteland City, uh, you feel like you're in a living, breathing, post-apocalyptic town. Yeah, other than the portos, as we can't ever get rid of those. But, uh, <laughs> a shitty necessity. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> There's design elements that I you know, actually really haven't talked much about. They're invisible and you don't know they're there unless you know they're there. And like anything, if you do it right, nobody knows you did it right. Uh, so each one of the main streets that lead into the city has an end cap. That's something that's visible all the way out to the farthest reaches of general camping. So you can be the farthest end of the event and walk and look down in toward Wasteland City and see on one end of the street, there's the Thunderdome. There's the main gates and then the stage behind it. Outpost 364, an amazing iconic structure that pulls you down that street towards the theme area. And it progressively, we've spilled out into the theme zone of some camps. Some of them are really well themed. Some of them are you know, kind of half-assed. Some of them, they're just getting their feet wet for the first time without, without the expectation of responsibility that they can, they can do this. They, they're actually, they can join and be a part of this. And as you cross each one of those thresholds, become more and more immersed in the city. That's something that has evolved. And when you get into the city itself, it's designed like, and I use the term human pinball. What do you see when you get to the gates? When you look left, when you look right, what do you see when you reach the Atomic Cafe? You look left, you look right. There's the Thunderdome, there's the stage, there's the bombers and that were here this year with the plane. You're kind of bounced in between all of these things. And when you've reached a point where you're kind of looking to do the next thing, there's a line of sight to every one of those major entertainment hubs. And you watch it happen in real time. That's not an accident, uh, but probably shouldn't have said that now. <laughs> uh, I definitely noticed. Uh, the one that really cued me in, because Thunderdome is huge. I feel like sometimes you can see it from anywhere. Yeah. And same thing with the stage. It's such a gravitational uh, mass. But when I was on the East Road, I forget its name, uh, and I was all the way out in Tent City. Damnation Alley? Yeah. And I did look back and I saw 364 all lit up yep. just as far as you could see. And there's that weird effect of um, of compression, uh -huh. right? When you're looking really far away and it just made it look even bigger than it is. And, and it's a beacon that, you know, it pulls you down that street. Yeah. And I talked to Ellie at one point and she was... <laughs> She was saying, yeah, Adam said, move it here. And I was like, I don't know why. Move it here. Just move it here. I don't know why. And then we built it and we were like, I don't know what this was about, but okay. And then they saw their own camp the way it was presented. And we're like, oh, right. Yeah, I've talked to Ellie uh, just uh, last night. And Ellie's the faceless merchant. Faceless merchants. Mm -hmm. Ellen Thris. Uh And there's some stories there too. But... Uh, She's one of the very few people that, that got it, that could see it. And the struggle for me is I'm not, a, I'm not an artist in that I can draw, uh, here's your plan of what we're doing. I see it in my head, 
I can move all the parts around and what does it look like like this? What does it look like at night? What's it look like with the sun here? And I can, all of those pieces, uh, you know, I can move them all around in, in my head. Now, how do I, how do I explain that to someone? I can't magically impart this to someone. So there's a few, very few people, including Ellie, who I start to describe the concept and then you see the, you know, the eyes light up and, oh, oh, yeah. And then they see it. And I'm really hoping that Ellie is uh, Ellie's going to be a part of that. While we're on that, I've heard you mention, this was specifically about JR last night, that he speaks Adam. And I know you've had some communication issues with people over the years. Talk to me a little bit about, like, how you communicate and, uh, and why it works better with some people than others. Well, I guess to really go into why communication is something I've had, had to work on a lot is that uh, I'm on the spectrum. I guess that's the new word for it, uh, autism. I was diagnosed as a kid with, uh, I guess they called it Asperger's at the time. Uh, they're trying to move away from some of those older diagnoses. But, uh, and the reason I know is uh, they t gave me a whole bunch of tests and didn't know what to do with me. You know, scoring off the chart on IQ and scoring off the chart on all these things, you know, it was supposed to be five or six grades ahead of where I was at. I was a problem child, don't get me wrong. I was, they, they, <laughs> uh, and I couldn't figure out why when they made the cut to uh, separate, you know, the gifted kids from the, the normies, uh, I wasn't chosen. They just threw me back in general population. And, you know, being a very resourceful kid, I decided to go find out what they'd written in that report. And I had a key, master key, because, you know, they were really good about locking up all the doors except for the the, uh, the the part of the engineering department where you can make keys. I, I was, you could, so I just had a master key. It didn't break it. I just opened up and got in. This was before computers and it was just all paper records. And I didn't understand a lot of the things that were written, but uh, you know, I was diagnosed as you know, with having Asperger's, high functioning autistic. Uh, and in almost every Every, they did several tests. Every one of them came back. It was you know this is not this is somebody who's going to be disruptive to everybody else in a learning environment. They were right, <laughs> but uh, it set me in a it set me in a course where I didn't know how to communicate or be a part of what is normal. Uh, Issues with sensory issues with being in rooms with a lot of people, uh, sound, sounds a big one. Here Adam takes off his noise canceling headphones for the first time during the interview. For every, every year, every year at school, I got kicked out. I got suspended. I got, I got kicked out of several schools. Uh, sometimes it was deserved. Uh, I, mean, I, was, I was a little terror. But the communication thing, you know, people would say something and it was like, I understood what they were saying. I mean, like the words, but I didn't get the context. I didn't get, or, or my context was different than theirs. Almost in some ways when somebody would say something, it's scrolling through 50 different responses all of them on different tangents that completely unrelated to the thing somebody just asked me. And then somewhere in that scroll of 50 responses, that one came out that was, and yes, on some weird tangent related to the thing somebody said to me, but what, what was that? What the fuck was that? I've worked at it very, very hard. I tell people I'm autistic. I guess people, you know, I don't like that it's become the new fad. I'm like every time you know, oh, I'm autistic. You know, somebody does something you're not supposed to do. Oh, I'm autistic. It's a reason, not an excuse. You're supposed to work on it. You're supposed to make yourself be better at it. You're not supposed to just go take fucking drugs or use it as an excuse not to improve how you, you know, relate to people. You know, by the way, this is me working on it. Uh, and I'm not good, uh, but I'm better. And 
you know, I've read, you know, books like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And every single time I read it, it's like, it's a new book. I never read it. I've never seen it before in my life. There's checks and balances I make myself go through before I respond. So sometimes that, that stare everyone thinks is me just being weird is the kind of, I have 50 responses, which one's the right one, read the situation, read the room, and try to do the best I can. The Baron, and he was probably meant it as an insult, but he was correct, once said that, you know, Adam was like an alien that came to Earth and read the manual on being human. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Baron. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was pretty close. A lot of it's just, you know, been trying to learn. I don't like masking. That's not a good word. It's called you know, adapt, adapting. It's called handling your shit. It's your shit. You're the one responsible for, for dealing with it. And I'm doing the best I can. Sound management has been a very, very big part of that. And that's, we, we're going to come back to that at some point. Okay. Okay. Along with dealing with yourself, you've also talked very openly about your acceptance of others. Has Wasteland helped you to accept people with different lifestyles and um, different ideas of the world? Uh, not, I don't know that it really has. Uh, you know, my parents didn't give me a whole lot of education on the way things are now today because they didn't, you didn't talk about a lot of that. Uh, but my dad for whatever else taught me, you treat everybody the same. Doesn't matter what their gender is. Doesn't matter what, you know, their, the skin color is. Doesn't matter where they came from. Treat everybody the same. And I've always lived my life that way. I'm a little older and I don't get the lingo these days. I, I could, that's been, that's been a catch up progress. I mean, pro, you know, process that kind of it seems to change every single time. I think I got it right. No, nope. it got changed again. What last month? I, Come on, old man. Why don't you know this? You know, and to some, some respects, I do agree that this is something we should, you know, all of us be working towards. And other ones, it's like, man, you're just, just inventing reasons to be mad at each other. This isn't helping. You're just inventing reasons to separate people instead of bring them together. I have seen improvement in how I relate to that. But no, I've always tried to treat everybody the same. And I must say that you and Jared and Carl, when he was on staff, watching the way you guys will protect Wastelanders, even at the detriment of selling tickets. Oh, yeah. You've created a, a incredibly accepting city here. Can you talk to me about, like, you know, when you first had to start weeding some people out of this community because of that? All right. Well, this is the last one. So uh, I've got to be careful what I say, mm -hmm. not to drop names. Yeah, there were people that should have been gone from this community long before they were. And it started early Wasteland. We'd, we'd really tried to be accepting of people and even some behavior that, it's mo if, you know, people getting a little rowdy, people getting drunk. You know, there's the, there's a range of, you know, you get a hundred people together, someone's going to do something dumb. You get a thousand people together, absolutely, people are going to do something dumb. And it's not always malicious. Sometimes it's worth giving somebody another chance. But there's some behavior that's just absolutely fucking unacceptable and you don't get another chance. That was it. You, you fucked up. One of the very first things Jared and I did when we had full control of Wasteland was go down the list of <laughs> ax these motherfuckers. Done. <laughs> they aren't coming back. And no regrets on any of them. <laughs> it's gotten more difficult every year because the threshold of what is acceptable behavior and what isn't is a sliding scale of the court of Facebook. And that's not how it's supposed to work. We're expected to ban people just because they're unpopular in the moment. We're expected to listen to the rumors that have been spread and why aren't we banning this person when there hasn't been a single shred of any firsthand account brought to our attention. Uh, the, the level of what is bannable and what isn't has gone to, you know, somebody said something someone didn't like on Facebook and why aren't we banning the five people who liked that comment? This isn't what I signed up for and that isn't what this is supposed to be. But 
there's also we're still we're still figuring out where that line is really kind of came to a head during covid when everybody couldn't go out and do anything for real in life and was stuck at home and just fucking all they did was cannibalize each other online that was all the only existence anyone had and it just tore people apart you know where is that line where you know what is what is it where does wasteland say you can come to this event and you can't because of your behavior online and that's a that got a, that got into some territory that I feel like maybe we we crossed the line, uh, and I don't think we even knew we'd crossed the line until we looked back and oh yeah that, that was I guess that was it that was the line what what are we even doing here? Yeah, there's there, there's some things you you come across somebody's profile and it's a magnet for white supremacist groups and nothing but hate and stupidity. Uh, I don't know, fuck that guy. I don't want him here. That's not the community we want. It's not the, the life and the blood of this place. There's a threshold somewhere on there where what someone chooses to put on their profile displays who they are, and they can get fucked. Uh, but, you know, somebody makes a mistake, posts something that's, you know, maybe a little insensitive, doesn't even not necessarily knowing it. There's a big generational gap in that now, too. And everybody's ready to just throw them under the bus. I'm not okay with that. It's not where we should be going as human beings, but we are rapidly approaching a society that can't accept anyone who believes something, anything different than they do. Yeah, and if you exile the people who think differently than you, then you can't influence them for the better. You can't slam the door on them and then be angry that they didn't go through the door. Right, right. You mentioned Carl and the Carl years. Actually, would you would you would you tell me so that just so I can have it? Uh, will you tell me who uh, owned Wasteland when you first started? Uh, it was the three of you. It was this nebulous. I don't even remember what how it was worded. This nebulous agreement of who was doing what and what jobs there were, and it was not a good business agreement. Uh, it was like some shit you. With kids drew on crayons in the fucking treehouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, Carl seemed to think he did, but no, it wasn't. That wasn't how that arrangement was ever. It wasn't how any of that was uh, brought to me, to Jared, to any of us. We we all signed that in crayon on that fucking piece of paper that up in the clubhouse, and then when things, you know kind of went to shit and we weren't agreeing on things. Uh, the only thing we had to see any kind of legal binding was this shred of paper with the crayon drawing on it and wasteland. Luckily we figured it out, but it was not well defined. <laughs> <laughs> All right, talk to me a, a little bit about um Wasteland's growth over the next few years and how um, buying a new piece of land was part of that <laughs> next plan. The growth of Wasteland in 2015, oh yeah, we, we took it to a whole other level. Jared and I, with the, uh, you know, with the reins of being able to make these calls and uh, not have to be in constantly fighting over things, uh, we worked pretty well together even from right from the beginning. You know, this question of, hey, we need to get we need to get some safety gear for build crew. It's I can't you know. It's we need more than this. And Jared's like, we'll just get whatever the fuck we want. Like this is this is dumb. Why don't we have these things? You know, trying to use people's personal vehicles. We were trying to move away from doing that, to getting stuff out here, and that's been a challenge for years. We went from being those kids in the treehouse with our little crayon drawing of what wasteland was to we have to make this real and survivable in the world that we are in now. We were on the radar for city, for county, for state. We were on the radar for every fucking government agency with their hand out. It was a different world and a different, you know, we weren't ready for it. Uh, and every year it was getting hit harder and harder into that realm of not being as big as a one of these larger festivals like Burning Man, but uh, we were on the radar enough that every government agency thought we were. And thoughts that that's what our budget was. Right. So uh, we'd already outgrown H Park. I remember coming, you know, it's nothing but desert out there. I actually went out and mapped where H Park was, and then I'm looking over like, oh, fuck, you know, we're, 
were spilling, like Tent City was just spilling out into the desert, which no one gave a fuck. But technically, because California City had it on a city grid, well, though, you can't do that. That's not a city park. Like, oh, God, <laughs> really? Uh, archery got killed. Somebody called in and reported it, you know, found some little loophole in some thing that says you can't have archery in a city park without A, B, C, D, and E. Well, it's it's H Park, the fuck out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, but technically it was a city park. And now there was all these loopholes and fees and certifications and rules that totally make sense in an urban environment. Yeah. Do you really, in an urban environment, some little small city park want people shooting bows and arrows? No. But they couldn't get past that loop, that little line in the law, because they all, every city just carbon copies from urban. <laughs> and we were losing the ability to have the freedoms we wanted to have, to do the things we wanted to do. And I'd been scouting. I actually had been scouting since 2015. I spent a lot of time driving, thousands and thousands of miles, going out into the desert, into weird places, and even a few where you know you come up on some hill and you go down the other side and you're like, hey, this is great. And hey, what's that? Oh, hi, Mr. Shotgun. Could you please put your owner away? I'm leaving. I ended up in some Hills Have Eyes places, ended up in Nevada and Arizona, even as far as Utah, um, looking for new locations. And there were some that were okay, but there were the, the parameters had to be, we were within 45, we had to be within 45 minutes ambulance ride in any direction. There had to be a certain level of road available for that to happen. There had to be hospital and Medicare and helicopter and all those things available to it because if you don't have those things, someone's going to die. And that eliminated almost all of the really good locations visually and environmentally that if you didn't have that, you don't really have an event that's safe. And I had scouted, I'd scouted this place way back in 20, 2015 or 16. It was 15. It was 15. No, it was 15 because we started in the process well before that. So it was Winter Games 2014 or 15. I don't remember. Oh, goodness. I Winter Games was 2015. Say. Okay. I think. Because I remember dropping off my shit at Winter Games and coming back out here because we were starting to go through process of getting all the pieces together. I couldn't find a better spot. And here we are just, you know, a few miles from H Park. The spot was perfect. And luckily we found the right combination of realtors and people that could streamline the the process of acquiring different properties. And we were very, very kept it really on the DL, um, buying up individual properties, buying up separate properties under different names, trying to not spook, you know, investors. And that process was going on while we were still at H Park. Because we knew ahead of time, we can't keep, this is, there's no room to grow here. This is going to stagnate and die. You know, did you really want to limit the population to, you know, 1,200 or 2,000? Who gets to come then? That's, you know, talk about, you know, making something elitist. I don't want that. And it was a kind of a Christmas miracle, a wasteland miracle that we pulled it off, even down to the last few days under the wire, getting some of the permits pulled. But... It happened, and there were only four or five people in the world that knew about this place, where it was, until a few weeks before the event, 2017. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. Uh, and the, the new location came with, of course, some new freedoms and, mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, possibility of expansion, but it also came with some new red tape. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 if I'd have known... Then what I know now about the amount of red tape in California that attached to anything you want to do, I don't think I would have done this. I think I'd probably, I might have just said, fuck it. <laughs> it's that, it's that bad. Really? And it keeps getting worse. Wow. And we're in a situation in a state where government agencies, they all have their hand out and effectively it's extortion. Give us this much money or you don't get to do your thing. And you can't tell them no. And because the state's, you know, always in fundraising mode, 
it's kind of like you know, if the king can't afford to pay his men, he can send his king, his men out into the city to collect their wages. And when you have government agencies that can fund themselves by writing by fees and you're, that's effectively what we do. We're not too much farther out from a monarchy. You know, we haven't come that far from that. I know it sounded a little libertarian there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the idea of it. It's just not practical. It doesn't work. But I do love the idea of it. I think we're way past that, where that line should be. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And every time government agencies need more money, they just add more fines, add more fees, change the rules, uh, make you pay, pay them to get back the freedoms you had. And that is a contributing factor as to, you know, why I've made some of the decisions that I've made recently. It sounds like every year at Wasteland, you say at some point, Wasteland almost didn't happen this year. <laughs> has, it, has it always been that close? Yeah, every year. Why so? We just talked about that. Just trying to get through all the loopholes. Not loopholes, trying to not get through loopholes, all the- loopholes, it's trying to not, there's, there's no loopholes, it's you know, uh, every age, every government agency can wait till the very last minute and then, oh, pay us this. And it's too late to go above their head. It's too late to go up the chain of command. It's too late to tell city planning, hey, this other agency is going to kill all of the revenue of this location if we don't do this. I'm a little salty. Luckily, we have somebody who's <laughs> a far better communicator than I am. <laughs> that uh, does that particular job very well. And if we didn't, if it was in, if that particular job set was in my, uh, my wheelhouse, Wasteland wouldn't exist. And of course, you're talking about Jared. No. I'm talking about Jared and I'm talking about somebody, we have someone on staff who is a facilitator, works with government agencies, can speak government agency. Um, Jared is good at that, actually. He does a lot of it, but um, he's not really our point man. No, we've got somebody better at it. That's what they do. Do I know who this is? Probably. You don't want to say it? No. Okay. They've asked not to be. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. They get to come and enjoy this event, and when they're here, they don't want anybody knowing that they saved Wasteland. <laughs> so, uh, moving here obviously took the the event to a whole new level yep. where i mean i'll call them the latter years for now but hopefully <laughs> they're not right but it came with a new grid a, a whole new set of gates um the stage was just a couple years old at that point and um, a whole new enthusiastic bunch of wastelanders can you yeah. tell me what this location has done to the event well some things well, i definitely want to say are for the better i wanted an east west layout that was my original plan for this. And then some government agency, I don't remember what it's called, said, well, you have to do this two and a half year study and spend all of this money because this is technically a waterway and there was no way we were gonna get it done or could afford it. So I had to change the layout to north, no, to north um, south. It wasn't ideal, but it still works. Moved it into the lee of the hill, at least the city part. And a uh, fire department comes along and says, hey, our, our fire trucks are going to fit through your gate, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you got it. Yes, the, yes, it will. <laughs> hey, guys, we're building new gates. <laughs> I preemptively took some lessons from Burning Man, uh, seeing how they laid some things out where uh, fire hoses are typically not much more than 100 foot reach. So when I laid out the blocks, the blocks are all shy of the 200 foot mark in width. So a fire truck on any street can get any point within that block. This is the one I call the good part of government planning where, yeah, that makes sense. Let's, let's not have a gridlock somewhere where somebody's going to die because you couldn't get an ambulance in or a fire truck in. Keeping things in line with what you know the health department wanted and where certain things were going to be. Because again, there, there's reasons and those are some good reasons. Uh, but the layout definitely got, um, got changed by accident when Schizo was doing his, was helping, trying to help do the layout and added a 15 foot buffer on every single block after I'd already mapped it for something else. Interesting. 
Uh, the layout got a little bumped and a little weird on these roads. I don't know if you've seen some of the roads. They're not straight. We mapped it. We locked it down. We even had chalk lines and outlines and painted it. And when the uh, gravel trucks started showing up to lay the roads, you just watch them. Like, how did you even get here without it getting into a wreck? How they were just all those roads are everywhere. But you know what? Wasteland. Yeah. It still works. Yeah. I always figured they were crooked by design. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I always thought it was really interesting because of the fact that this one's north south and H Park was eastish, westish. Mm -hmm. uh, the Twin Hills almost echoed the old Twin Hills we had. So, in a lot of ways, the location feels similar. Uh, to me, it's very different. But at least having the kind of being surrounded by the hills, or at least having them on one side, that element is is similar. Uh, the east-west would have been better. At H Park, I went with an H east-west layout, so last light of day, uh, the golden hour would fall right on the city gates. That was on purpose. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't do that here. So north-south it is. Yep. <laughs> Everyone uh, had some funny things to say about my map because it obviously fits better horizontally. Yes. <laughs> but your brain is programmed to think the top of the map is north. Right. And when we released it, we did the whole map for 2017 and released it before anyone knew where that location was. Mm. And I built a, the little north, south, east, west thing you see on every map and just made every point north. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's talk about this year and its theme, Pass the Torch. Yeah. Uh, you were kind of teasing early on with the theme, uh, what was coming. Tell me about your process of deciding this was the year. Well, that's a loaded question and a long answer. It's a lot of questions right um, in there. But I knew I had a limited timeline that I was going to be able to do this uh, coming back out of COVID. I kind of knew before that, but uh, I was done and ready to walk away in 2020 uh, during COVID. Like, are we coming back or not? And nobody knew because COVID. Not a good year to be in the uh, live event business uh, or after. Hasn't Still hasn't recovered. But when the opportunity to come back and make another wasteland happened, that door opened, I couldn't walk away. I couldn't, I couldn't leave this thing without giving it a fighting chance of going on. And I knew that, I didn't know a date, but I knew that was, there, was a, there was a timeline. Uh, and I, we can come back to some of those reasons if you'd like to discuss them. But um, I knew there was a time. I didn't know what it was. Coming back to this was incredibly difficult. I was not in a good headspace. It was not in a good space, you know, emotionally, physically. It was actually doing pretty good. During COVID, I was actually down to a healthy weight again. I been putting a lot of it back on, having to come back to this. Uh, the stress of it, the sitting in front of a computer that I wasn't built for that. That's not what, that's not what I do. I spend more time troubleshooting and damage control for fucking social media than I do actually building wasteland. And the, the toll of that has been not just physical health, but mental health. And, you know, it's hard to talk about that. Also, I, my issue, my autism, the, the sensory uh, issues that I have, uh, have been getting worse. That's been degrading my ability to do this job. And that that window looking ahead, I didn't know how long I was going to be able to do this. So with that in mind and knowing that I didn't want to leave this w without leaving it in good hands, without passing the torch, I started in 2021 training people to, training people in the redundancy having more than one person that knew how to do a job, eliminating single points of failure, 
leaving behind instructions for the bazillion things that were in my head that only Adam knew. Because that isn't how you should be running things. It was never a good way of running things. Still isn't. <laughs> we're still there. But I've been working very hard over the last few years to impart all of this knowledge and not just the how you do something, but why do you do it? Why is why do the things look the way they look? Why why is the that layout? Why are you being pulled down the street and you're not even sure why subconsciously that it's because of the what you're seeing and the visual and even the lighting and you know I've been trying to pass on the thought process because that's what's going to live on. If somebody understands why, is it going to be the same thing in the future? Maybe not, but they understand the concept of it and can run, run with it and bring their own creativity to it. Passing the torch is, there's been a few staff members over the years who've pieced out and a few of them have tried to burn the whole fucking place down on their way out. Uh, I wanted to set the example when I left that this is how you do it. So, you know, in the time that somebody else decides that they're going to walk away, that they do it with dignity and they do it leaving behind a legacy that will go on after them. And you passed out a lot of torches. Talk to me about this next generation that has risen. <laughs> I had uh, the junksmith make um, a number of like physical t um, torches, and they're not really torches. They're you know, uh, if they were on fire, only bad things could happen. <laughs> so you know, each of them has a has a light. Every one of them is unique. Uh, there's no two that are quite the same. And holding that in your hand. It instills a sense of responsibility. Um, it represents your leadership of, you know, the department and the crew and the team and the aspect of this event that's critical to it happening every year. And my hope, and um, hope's a dangerous word, is that, you know, the people who I've handed those torches to will take that responsibility seriously that that torch means something, not just that physical thing in their hand, but um, it's the responsibility to train the next generation when their time has come. How's it feel? <laughs> Mixed emotions. And I'm sitting here next to Mustang Fury. Going to take it out on its very last ride in a few minutes. I sold it yesterday to a wastelander, so it's going to live on, it's going to come back, and that makes me happy. But it's kind of sad, too. I had to ask myself the question, you know, the hard question of uh, going into retirement, leaving this behind, what's going to pay the bills? What's going to, you know, do I need a Mustang or do I need you know, tools. Do I, do I need a Mustang or do I need to pay off some bills so those aren't hanging over my head later? Uh, pay off debt, be debt free. That's been not there yet, but working on it. So for the retirement fund and uh, may she ride to Valhalla all shiny and chrome <laughs> in good hands. Yeah, this is, it's bittersweet. What's next for you? Are we talking like what's next in the next week or month or year or where am I going with my life? Where are you going with your life? Because I know, I know you are staying on as owner. For now, yes. Without build, right? Yes. Well, that's complicated. Um, I am staying on through Neotropolis. This is my last wasteland. And it isn't my last wasteland on build. It's my last wasteland. Uh, thousands of people with all of their, every conversation and every noise and every generator and vehicle and, you know, sound system that I can't tune out. I don't have a filter. Uh, I hear all of it. And this is not a good environment for someone with my particular uh, set of autism. So that part I'm leaving behind. And Neotropolis, I'm staying through to help pass that torch. I'm not leaving until I'm leaving it in good hands. So uh, what happens after that? Uh, it's, there's still some vari variables, but I'm walking away. This is not the life I will be living. 
before Wasteland, you were heavily into photography, uh, fire effects, special effects, that kind of thing. Is that maybe in the realm or something totally different? Uh, never say never. Um, but picked up the camera again for Neotropolis and was actually really enjoying that. Uh, but even that has, you know, even that has lost its, this isn't the same world anymore. And art is supposed to be controversial. Art, art is supposed to make you think. Art is supposed to make someone mad. Uh, it's supposed to make you, you know, stop a little bit and think, I like this or I don't. It shouldn't be cancel culture. And that's now everything's attached to cancel culture. Everything's attached to, you know, it's the same, it's the same as religion. It's become, cancel culture has become religion. The same assholes on the right that want to burn books and tell women what to wear. Um, you've got a version of it on the left that, you know, wants to tell you what art can be and what art can't be. Your realm of creativity is a fucking minefield of what you can and can't do and what you can and can't take a picture of and what you can and can't say and what something can and can't mean. And that is an art to me. It's never supposed to be what art is. And I don't want to navigate that field anymore. I don't want to fight that. I'm done. I'm tired of that fight. That isn't what art is. It sucked the life out of me. It sucked the life out of everything. It's, it's not a life worth living. And I'm not going to do it anymore. You um, and Tim and quite a few others have talked about how you only just ever wanted to play fort with your friends in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> and how? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever actually been able to do that here. Maybe 2000. I don't know. What year were you not too busy to play fort with your friends in the desert? Never. 2011, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, we were still fixing shit all the way through the whole goddamn <laughs> event. <laughs> you know, uh, at least now there's a lot, a lot more shoulders for that to fall on. And I feel like I got a little taste of it this year. So I'm going to, I'm going to appreciate that. There's a lot of things I, I had planned. I had all kinds of shenanigans. I had... I guess since I'm not going to be able to do it anymore, I'll, you know, let some of them out of the bag. My, my one on my bucket list of things I'm never going to get to do is, uh, I'm never going to get to pee off the road rash tower on David DeFore. <laughs> now you might ask, why the fuck would you want to do that? Well, I wasn't actually going to do it. I had a water bottle. I actually had medical rig me up a water bottle with some catheter hose that I was had stuck in my pants and I was going to get up on the tower, call David DeFur over, hey buddy, <laughs> and then deal with the fallout later. Probably have to get scolded by security, but uh, well, if, you don't, if you don't have to get scolded by security at least once at some wasteland ever, uh, please don't do that. But, yeah, um, <laughs> I was just saying, like, mm, gives me ideas. Uh, oh, no, I, and believe me, I got into some jokes that maybe I took a little too far uh, or really weren't well thought out. I got to do some some pranks, had some shenanigans, so, yeah, I had some fun. Yeah, we felt it in the Duke's camp. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. We just wake up, and there's this little four, four-wheeler stuck in the tower that you built for us. <laughs> I was clear from the beginning when Chad asked me, hey, can we, you know, borrow some scaffolding for, to build a tower? Like, no, man, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a few weeks later, we're already here. We were actually already on site. And Jawa, one of, you know, the head of our uh, heavy logis heavy equipment and load logistics, hell, we're just sitting there giggling about all these things we have planned. And he's, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out where are we going to put Aliyah's cart this year. And it's got to be someplace structurally safe, but it's got to be up on something. It's not going to fall over. It's, you know, it has to be something we built because that way we know it's structurally safe. And all of a sudden the light went on. I'm like, hold on a second. Just, you know, just, just hold that thought. And I immediately ran back to my tent, got online, get a message out to Chad. Like, you still want that tower? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, all right, cool. But there's, there's some strings attached. At some point in time, something's getting stuck up in that tower. You cool with that? And he's like, yeah, all right, <laughs> deal. 
<laughs> I love it. The best part is we uh, we gave Aaliyah forklift lessons, for, so her very first thing she had to move was a scaffolding for the tower that we were going to put her car oh my God. into. <laughs> I love it. She's so game for anything, too. Um, <laughs> one of the sayings in Build Crew is, if Adam asks you if you want to do something and he won't tell you what it is, say yes. I didn't know that was a saying. <laughs> it is a saying. If he says get in the car, you get in the car. If he says come this way, you go that way. Because there's a, about to be something awesome that's going to happen. And I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's still a few people here. <laughs> I mean... The last time you did it for me, I mean, today, today's going to count, but the last time you did it for me, we got in the car and had one of the most intense conversations we've ever had, making me regret that it wasn't on tape. Yeah. Um, that was the first year you yelled at me for trying to build the wall with my camper. <laughs> <laughs> did I yell at you? No, you just said, you're not parking there and went away. And I was like, then where? And you're just driving away. <laughs> Communication skills. <laughs> <laughs> but then that was the year that you pulled up and just like, hey, we're going to talk. Let's go. And uh, Get in the car. Yeah. Doing this. <laughs> that was this car. That was this car. <laughs> we just had to slow drive around, just yep. ch- not chatting about anything in particular, just wasteland. Yeah. It, it, it's always amazing. Well, survivors, we're a little past halfway through the interview, so I figure it might be a good place to stop for part one. Part two will be up next week, and we're going to continue talking about the future of Wasteland Weekend, Adam's favorite year, and see if we can't find a little hope left in the world. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening, and if you're able to, you can help support this show at patreon.com slash theapocalypsepost. As always, if you liked this episode, share it with a friend. And if you hated it, share it with your enemies even if they are just aliens that came to Earth and read the manual on being human. See you next time, survivors. Stay alive. Mm